Welcome to a Legendarium special about John Elwes, the real-life miser who inspired Ebenezer Scrooge. In this special, we will talk about how a spendthrift young man transformed into one of the most infamous misers in British history. The great English author Charles Dickens is best known for his classic novella, A Christmas Carol. Ebenezer Scrooge, its protagonist, is still a synonym for a grumpy miser, or in modern terms, a greedy and cruel businessman. Yet how did Charles Dickens imagine this unpleasant and solitary moneylender transformed by Christmas spirit? Charles Dickens turned to a real-life miser, still infamous despite having died a half-century before Dickens published A Christmas Carol. John Elwes, born John Meggett in 1714, was the son of Robert Meggett, a respected London brewing magnate who died when John was only four years old. Meggett left his son John an inheritance of a hundred thousand pounds, equivalent to a couple of hundred million today. Yet despite the family's great wealth, they also had a tradition of never spending it. Though wealthy, John's mother reportedly starved herself to death because she refused to spend money on her own well-being. At first, John rejected the family tradition, becoming a party-going and hedonistic scholar at Westminster. He relished high society, horseback riding, and traveling abroad. At the gaming table, John became one of the most celebrated players of his day. John once played two days and two nights without a break and without sleep, and never using the same pack of cards a second time. Some said John and his fellow players were nearly up to their knees in cards by the end. He lost many thousands at that legendary sitting to the Duke of Northumberland, who would never quit a table when he had any hopes of winning. The main reason young John began to change his way of living was his greed for another inheritance, his uncle's. Sir Harvey Elwes owned an estate worth £250,000, yet spent none of it. To ingratiate himself to his uncle, John gave up the last name Meggett and took his uncle's surname of Elwes. When he visited him, he dressed as a miser, wearing a tattered waistcoat, a worn-out coat, and stockings fastened with iron buckles. There, John and his uncle Harvey shared a single glass of wine and laughed at how others wasted their money. Though the spendthrift young man started off playing the role of a miser, he slowly embraced it. John still sat whole nights at the gaming tables, staking thousands with the most fashionable men of his day, amid splendid rooms, gilt sofas, wax lights, and waiters. Yet he would walk out in four at the morning into Smithfield to meet his own cattle coming to market in London from Essex. There, forgetful of what he just did, Elwes stood in the cold and rain, haggling with a butcher for a shilling. Sir Harvey died in 1763, leaving an estate worth $23 million today to his nephew John, who had changed his name to Elwes. Having gotten the money, the 42-year-old John also kept his uncle's miserliness. He lived in a mansion with many rooms and luxury furniture. Yet during the winter, the young Elwes spent most of his time in the kitchen with his servants, so he did not have to pay for a fire in the living room. Refusing to pay money for maintenance on his house, water started dripping from every hole in the roof, and the grand furniture rotted into a state of complete decay. Elwes wore ragged clothes everywhere he went and even slept in them. Sometimes men mistook him for a beggar and gave him a penny or two, much to his joy. His meals included moldy food. Once he saw a rotten moor hen in a river and wrestled it away from a giant rat so he could eat the rotting meat himself. Delicious! 
John Elwes wore a tatty rig he f- wig he found discarded in a hedge and walked everywhere to avoid paying for coaches. Yet a closer look at Elwes's life shows him to be more than a real-life Scrooge. He invested his money in farms and cattle, becoming an international magnate by putting money into ironworks in the United States. And when it came to other people, John Elwes could be generous, lending money to people in real distress and often proving too polite to ask for repayment. One story says he once lent a friend £7,000 so he could bet it on a horse race. Elwes himself showed up at the racetrack with nothing to eat for the whole day but a two-month-old pancake he found in his coat pocket. He also provided a loan to a man named Tempest so he could purchase an army commission. Most notably, he became a patron of the architect Robert Adam and thus financed the distinctive Georgian architecture of London's West End. This includes Portman Square, parts of Oxford Circus, Piccadilly, Baker Street, and the Marleybone neighborhood, where Elwes owned numerous properties. Like his uncle, John Elwes won election as a member of Parliament for Berkshire in 1772 and remained at the position for 12 years. He boasted of paying only 18 pence in election expenses for his rotten borough. Whenever he traveled to London for his job, Elwes rode an ancient, emaciated horse rather than ride in a carriage to avoid the expensive turnpike poles. He put a hard-boiled egg into his pocket, and midway on his journey, he would sit under a hedge, eat his egg, and sleep. Though officially a member of the Tory party, he voted for Whig bills if he found them cheaper. Some of his displeased Tory colleagues grumbled that they would call him a turncoat, but Elwes only owned one coat. After 12 years, Elwes retired rather than face the horrifying prospect of laying out any money to retain his seat in Parliament. At the age of 60, John Elwes became consumed with his obsession with money. One story has it that Elwes hurt both his legs while walking in the dark because he wouldn't pay for a lamp. He allowed an apothecary to treat only one leg while wagering his fee that the untreated limb would heal first. Elwes won the bet and refused to pay the doctor. At his neglected and dilapidated houses, Elwes forbade repairs, joined his tenants in the post-harvest gleaning so he could get a few handfuls of grain, and if a stable boy put out hay for a visitor's horse, Elwes would sneak out and remove it. In his final years, Elwes moved among his unrented properties in the Marleybone neighborhood of London, taking a table, two chairs, and a bed with him, leaving whenever he learned the property would be rented out to a new tenant. He often became sick because he would not light a fire even in the dead of winter. Towards the end of his life, Elwes grew delusional, hoarding small quantities of money here and there, continually checking all the places of deposit. He feared he would die in poverty and began struggling with imaginary robbers at night, crying, I will keep my money! Don't rob me! Oh, don't! Even his barrister, who drew up his 800 thousand pound will wrote in the firelight by the dying miser's bedside to save the cost of a candle his vast fortune grown by investment and extreme frugality went to his two illegitimate sons george and john elwes through the vast inheritances that he gave his illegitimate sons, his generosity to his friends, and his investment in London's beautiful Georgian architecture, we can say that the ultimate legacy of John Elwes has more in common with the reformed Scrooge rather than the miserable miser who lived before the spirits of Christmas came. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.